So this question has been asked in gate 2006. We have been given three processes. We have been given three processes. P0, P1 and P2. And their arrival time is the same. All arrive at time 0. And we have been given the burst times as well. We have been given the burst times of these processes. So the burst times happen to be 2, 4 and 8 units respectively. Now we have to find the average turnaround time using longest remaining time first scheduling. Right? LRTF scheduling algorithm. Now remember LRTF is the preemptive version of LJF. Longest remaining time first is the preemptive version of longest job first. So what happens in longest remaining time first is the process having the longest remaining burst time is given the CPU first. Okay. And if to have the same remaining burst time, then the arrival time acts as a tiebreaker. And if they end up having the same arrival time as well, then the process number will resolve the type. Now let's solve this question. So we again make use of an at chart. So what happens is we start with the process having the least remaining burst time, right? So the process with the least burst time is P0, right? But since we are going with longest remaining time first, so the process which has the maximum burst time remaining. Now see, process P2 has a remaining burst time of 8 units, right? So process P2 will be scheduled first. So process P2 will be scheduled first because out of these three, its burst time is the maximum. But for how many units will it be scheduled? It will be scheduled for, let's say it will be scheduled for 4 units. Now see, at the 4th unit of time, what happens is P2 has a remaining burst time of 4 units. P1 also has a remaining burst time of 4 units. So now these two processes, P1 and P2, are competing with each other. Now which one will get the CPU? Now P1 will get hold of the CPU. Why? Because just as I mentioned a minute back, that if two processes have the same burst time, then the arrival time will act as the tiebreaker we will always schedule a process which has the highest burst time. Since these two processes have the same burst time, the arrival time acts as a tiebreaker. But we find that the arrival time of these two processes is also the same. So the process number will act as the tiebreaker. Since P1 is lower than P2, so we schedule P1 now. So we schedule P1 now because it has a lower process number. But for how many units will we schedule it? See, we will schedule it for only one unit. P1 will be scheduled for only one unit. Why? Because after it executes for one unit of time, the burst time of P2 becomes more than that of P1. See, P2 has a burst time of 4 now. So it has to be scheduled. Now, see, this is what we call thrashing. Constant swapping of processes in and out of memory. See process P2 will get hold of one unit and now again process P1 will get hold of the CPU. So this constant movement is going to waste precious CPU time. Right? Now again P2 will get hold of the CPU. So context switching is occurring, right? Each of these points represent a context switch and context switch incurs a significant amount of CPU time. So it's an overhead. And in this case, we're seeing that this overhead is increasing greatly as each new process is scheduled. In fact, no new process is scheduled. The processes are switching or swapping among themselves. Now P2 is here right now. Now see. P0, P1, P2 all have the same remaining burst time. So arrival time, we look at the arrival time. Again, it's the same. So now we end up looking at the process number. Out of these three, P0 will be scheduled because its 
ID is lower than that of the other two processes. So P0 will get scheduled for how many units of time? Again, for one unit of time. Because when it has a burst time of 1, P1 and P2 have higher burst times. So now the competition is between P1 and P2. We find that P1 will get hold of the CPU once again. And then again, so its burst time will reduce by 1. And P2 will get hold of the CPU now. So its burst time will also reduce by 1. And again, we'll have P0 coming into the system, right? So now we can understand. You'll get P1 for one unit, P0 for one unit, sorry, P1 for another unit. And finally, P2 will be the last process to execute, right? So that brings an end to the scheduling of my processes. But now we have to find the average turnaround time. Now in order to find the average turnaround time, what we first need to find is the completion time of the processes. Since we find these processes to fall to yeah to fall under a preemptive scheduling category, we'll have to look from right to left in order to find the completion time. We'll look from right to left. See, while scanning from right to left, the NAC chart, we find that there is P2. P2 has a completion time in this box. See, observe this box this part only so in this unit we find that p2 is completing its execution at 14th unit of time so the completion time of p2 is 14 next we find p1 we haven't seen p1 before we have seen p2 so we'll take this into consideration p1 has a completion time of 13 in this box right consider just this box so p1 has a completion time of 13 so P1 will have a completion time of 13 overall as well. And again, now we encounter P0. P0 has not been seen before. So we'll consider this time frame and we find that this time frame, this time frame is getting over at 12th unit of time. So the completion time of P0 is 12. Now let's scan further. We encounter P2, but we have already found the completion time of P2. So we'll ignore this. Again, moving on. We encounter P1, but we have already found the completion time of P1. So we'll ignore this. P0, we have already found it. So we'll ignore. Again, P2, found it, ignore. P1, found, ignore, ignore, ignore. And finally, you ignore this and you get completion time of P0 to be 12, P1 to be 13 and P2 to be 14. Okay. Now, moving on. We can find the turnaround time now. What is turnaround time? The turnaround time is the total time spent by a process in the system right from the moment it enters the system till the point of its completion. So what is the time which indicates a process's arrival or a process's entry into the system? The arrival time, right? The arrival time will indicate the process's entry time into the system and what time indicates the process's exit from the system? The completion time will indicate the processes exit from the system. So completion time for P0 is 12. For P0, the arrival time is 0. So 12 minus 0 will give me a value of 0. I mean, will give me a value of 12. Sorry, sorry about that. 12 minus 0 will give me 12, right? And what about P1? P1 again will follow the same formula. So completion time minus arrival time and I'll get 13. And once again, 14 minus 0 will give me 14. So we have been asked to find the average turnaround time, right? So the average turnaround time, so the average turnaround time will be what? Will be 12 plus 13 plus 14. That means sum of the individual turnaround times and divided by 3. Why? Why divided by 3? Because we have 3 processes. So this will come to be, I think, 12 plus 13 would give me 25. 25 plus 14 will give me uh, 39, right? 39 divided by 3. So 39 is a multiple of 3. So we get 13. So the average turnaround time is 13 units. So I hope this helps. Thank you.